Well, good morning and welcome to Celebration Church. We are so glad that you are here with us today because today is Palm Sunday. And today is the day that we celebrate Jesus riding in to Jerusalem amongst great celebration. And today we're going to celebrate what the Lord is going to accomplish for us through his death on the cross. And today we want to begin with this passage from Hebrews chapter 12. I want to show you something that reminds us of all that Jesus came to do. Hebrews 12, 2 says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus came to give his life for us. And then the Bible says that afterwards, he would sit down at the place of authority at the right hand of God the Father. So as we begin our service today, would you join me? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together today. Even though we may not be meeting in a building, Perhaps some are watching or listening to us in, in a variety of different places today. And even though, even though the building may be closed, the church is still open because we as believers are still gathering to celebrate all that you have done for us during this Easter season. And so, Lord, how we thank you and praise you today that Jesus so willingly offered up his life to die on a cross that we might have eternal life with you. And that after he completed his work, he is seated at the very right hand of the Father. And so, Lord, today we come before you to worship you, to lift up your name. We pray, Lord, that you would be glorified. And we thank you that you are with us in spirit today. And where, where, wherever we may be listening or watching this service, you are there. And we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today I want to introduce to you someone who is a new intern with us, and her name is Sammy Carpentera, and she is a student at Simpson University located in Redding, California, and she is going to come and share a very special worship song that she wrote just about a week ago just for us today. So here is Sammy. In the morning I rise to greet you In the morning all my days Praise you God, oh hallelujah It is well, Lord, with my soul You are safety, you are refuge God, I praise you all my days Praise you, God, oh, hallelujah, it is well, Lord, with my soul, soul. Hallelujah. 
Well, thank you, Sammy, for sharing that special song with us today. And truly, it is well with our soul when we think of all that Jesus has done for us and all that he has accomplished. And so today on this Palm Sunday weekend, we want to take a look at the scriptures together. And, and you know, as I was thinking about our message for today, and I realized that because we are more of a church scattered than we are a church gathered at this particular season we find ourselves in, and we're not going to be able to gather for our normal uh, Good Friday evening uh, celebration and worship service together, I thought that for our message today, we would, we would move forward to the scene of the cross. And so I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles today, and would you turn with me to Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, as we look together at the day God died. Mark chapter 15. You know, of all the deaths in the annual annals of, of human history, there is none that is greater than the death of Jesus Christ. And as we come to Mark 15 today, this is a, an absolutely unbelievable scene. It's, it's an experience that literally defies description. Now, we can read about, we can, we can think about the death of Jesus, but just, just imagine this for a moment. To think of the creator of all of the universe dying on a cross 2,000 years ago is literally an impossible situation, an impossible experience to really get our minds around. We can read about it, but trying to grasp what the crucifixion must have meant to Jesus is literally beyond comprehension. So in Mark chapter 15, we're going to begin as we look at the suffering of the Messiah, beginning in verse 33. Mark writes, and he says, When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In this section where we're looking at the suffering of the Messiah, I want you to look closely with me at his statement from the cross. Now, Jesus has been hanging on the cross for about six hours, between nine in the morning and three in the afternoon. Matthew tells us that darkness engulfed the entire area. In fact, the Old Testament associates exactly what went on with this scene right here. Jesus hanging on the cross, darkness in the Old Testament was always associated with judgment. In fact, if the light of God is salvation, the darkness of God is a sign of judgment. And did you know historically that it was reported throughout all of the Roman Empire that it was strangely dark for three hours at this very moment in time. For three hours, God supernaturally turned off the sun as a sign of judgment. And so here we have Jesus while he's hanging on the cross in utter darkness. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that very moment, as those very words were spoken, Jesus experienced the horror of being abandoned by God. At that very moment that those words were spoken, he was experiencing the terror of being alienated from God. Imagine for the first time in, 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 in history past, for all time, God the Son was separated from God the Father. For the very first time, Jesus felt the absolute horror of aloneness from the presence of the Father. Not only that, but at that very moment in time, imagine this, the weight of the sins of all of the world for all time were placed upon Christ. In fact, Paul in the 
letter to the Galatians, chapter 3 and verse 13, writes about this very scene. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Imagine Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. He's taken upon himself the sins of the entire world. What would that have meant to Jesus? What would that have been like for him? All of the murders, all of the lust, all of the fornication, all of the adultery, all of the homosexuality, all of the idolatry, all of the pornography, all of the pride and the, and the theft and the stealing and the crime and the prejudice and evil and hate and cursing and lying and gossiping and deceiving, all of the sin for all of people throughout all the ages of time suddenly is placed upon Christ. And it's then that Jesus cries out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 is another passage that reminds us of what was happening at this very moment of time. The Bible says he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin. He took the one who is absolutely sinless and upon him he dumped and placed the sins of all humanity for all time. How could the perfect sinless son of God become cursed as he hung on the cross? Is something that we can't even begin to comprehend or understand. Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? The word forsaken, the Greek word, is also used in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, where it's translated deserted. As Paul refers to that time in his ministry, when he had been deserted by one of his companions by the name of Demas. What we have here is a picture of absolute rejection and aloneness on the part of Jesus Christ. In fact, as the sin of the world was being placed upon Christ, God turned his back on his son. At that very moment in time, as the sin of the world was placed on Christ, God was turning his back on his son. That's the meaning of the word deserted. For Christ to be forsaken, for Christ to be abandoned by God, was to have God literally as the sin of the world is placed upon him, God has turned his back away from his son. You say, what is the meaning of the cross? What did the cross mean for Jesus as he was hanging there that day? Well, let me answer that question for you. The cross was an act of God's judgment against sin. In judging sin, God the Father turned away from God the Son. That had never happened before in all eternity past. It will never happen again. But for one moment in history, the Father and the Son were alienated. They had never experienced anything like that in their relationship ever before. But in this moment of time, it happened. Now, Mark goes on to tell us that as Jesus hung on the cross, those who heard his cry began to accuse him of calling out in anguish and in desperation for Elijah. You say, well, why did they make that mistake? How did that happen? The reason it happened is because the Aramaic word for God, because Jesus spoke Aramaic, the Aramaic word for God sounds very similar to the Hebrew word for Elijah. 
And so when the crowd that was standing around the foot of the cross heard his words, they turned it into mockery. They were literally saying, oh, poor misguided Messiah. He's asking for Elijah to come and rescue him. And so you'll notice in verses 35 and 36, Mark records what happened. When some of the bystanders heard it, they began saying, Behold, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him a drink, saying, Let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. So the crowd heard what he said, misunderstood his cry to God, thinking he was calling out to Elijah to come and rescue him. And it was then, Mark tells us in verse 36, that someone ran and grabbed a reed. Now, a reed was, was, was not anything longer than about somewhere between 18 and 24 inches, between a foot and two feet long. And they grabbed it and they, they put some sour wine on it and they put it up to his mouth to drink. And that tells us if the reed is, is, that, is that length that Jesus, as he's hanging on the cross, was, was not more than a foot or two above the heads of the people who were literally standing there watching all of this. Well, secondly, I'd like you to notice in this passage, we've looked at the suffering of the Messiah, but would you notice in verse 37 now, his sovereign death and the way Mark describes it to us. It says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. I want you to know something. As Jesus was hanging there on the cross, Jesus did not die by mere physical exhaustion. In spite of the horrors of crucifixion and the beatings and all that Jesus had gone through, it wasn't that that was taking his life from him. In fact, if we look closely at the Bible, we discover that his life was not taken from him. But rather, Jesus gave his life away as a sovereign act of his will. Now, Mark and Luke record the fact that as he's hanging on the cross, Jesus breathed his last. But Matthew, as he describes this scene in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 50, he uses a different, a different word. He says that Jesus, while on the cross, yielded up his life. And the word yielded there literally means to hand over, to let go, to give up of. In other words, Jesus was not wasting away there on the cross Life was not taken from him, but rather Jesus yielded. He gave up his life to death. Jesus said this is exactly what was going to happen to him. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus talked about this idea that, that he was going to give up his life. He says in John 10, 11, and we'll read several verses here. He begins, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. For this reason, the Father loves me, because, notice again, he says, I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. Now, watch these words. He says, I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. What is he telling us? Crucifixion did not kill Jesus Christ. Yes, it was painful. Yes, it was despicable. Yes, it was horrible, and the suffering he endured was traumatic. But it wasn't crucifixion that took his life. Jesus, the Bible says, laid down his life. He decided when it was time at the direction of the Father for him to yield up, for him to give his life over to death. Crucifixion could not kill him. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, if you'll notice again in the passage we've just been looking at here in Mark chapter 15, how do we know that crucifixion did not kill Jesus? Well, I want you to look back at verse 34 again. 
It says that the ninth hour Jesus, watch this, cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, he's yelling with a loud voice. This is not a man who's wasting away and, and, and barely able to eke out a sentence. Again, notice in verse 37, Jesus, it said, uttered a loud cry. A second time, he speaks with, with forceful vigor. His life is still in him. Jesus could have hung on the cross a lot longer. But once again, in fulfilling the scripture that his legs would not be broken, Jesus yielded up his life. He let go of his life. And he did it in his time. But I want you to notice, secondly, in this passage today, as we consider the scene of the death of God, there were surprising results that occurred immediately following the verses we've just read. In fact, I want you to look with me at five surprising results that occurred the day God died. The first one is the renting of the temple in verse 33, or excuse me, verse 38 of chapter 15. It says, and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Do you realize that when Jesus died on the cross, the moment that occurred, the veil in the temple was torn asunder. Now, you remember that that veil hung in the temple separating the holy place from the holy of holies. The holy of holies was the, was the place where the high priest would enter once a year and once a year only into the very presence of God to offer a sacrifice for the entire Jewish nation. As Jesus was on the cross and he gave up his life, the moment that that happened, the Bible tells us that the veil in the temple was torn. Now that veil probably was at least an inch thick. It was, it was a heavy fabric canvas. And God, at that moment in time, supernaturally ripped it apart. And at that point when that was happening, do you know that there were hundreds of people who were in the temple because they were offering lambs for slaughter in preparation for the Passover meal that night? When Jesus died on the cross, lambs were being slaughtered in the temple. And at that point, the veil was torn asunder. You say, what did that represent? Why was that important? The death of Christ marked the literal end of the priesthood, the end of the old covenant, the sacrificial system, and the temple. All of that ended the very moment that Jesus gave up his life on the cross. The death of Christ was the end of the Old Testament covenant. It was the end of the priesthood. It was end, the end of the sacrificial system. All of it came to an end as well as legitimate worship in the temple. In other words, the new covenant had now been initiated. The old had been fulfilled in the new. All that the old pointed to was now being fulfilled in what Jesus had just accomplished on the cross. But not only that, it's important for us to realize that when that veil was, was torn asunder, it signified that now every single person has direct access into the very presence of God. Do you realize that you don't have to go to a church to have access to God? You don't have to go to a temple or a synagogue. You don't have to go through a priest or even a pastor. When Jesus died on the cross, it opened the door for every single person to now have direct and personal access into the presence of God the Father for all time. Hebrews chapter 10 is a great passage that reminds us of exactly what Jesus accomplished that day on the cross. By this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest 
stands ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Therefore, the writer to the Hebrews concludes, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place, how? By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us, let us draw near. See, direct access. Let us draw near with sincere hearts in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, the writer to the Hebrews is reflecting back on this moment when the veil in the temple was rent and direct access now became available for all people. And now the writer to the Hebrews says, now, because the way has been made available to us, let us draw near to God. He welcomes us. He wants us to draw near. So as Jesus hung on the cross that day, there were some very surprising events. First was the renting of the temple veil. Secondly, I want you to notice the mark of the cent- remark of the centurion in verse 39. When the centurion, who was standing right in front of him, saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. Here is a hardened Roman soldier, a centurion, a commander over a hundred people. As he is standing there at the foot of the cross and he is beholding all of the, the things that we've just been looking at, the darkness, the words of Jesus, he is convinced that Jesus was God. In fact, in Matthew 27, the Bible says he was literally frightened, taken aback by all that he saw. But Luke tells us that at this moment that he was declaring that Jesus, in his opinion, was clearly God's son, that there was something supernatural about this man and about this death. The Bible says that he began praising God. You know something? I think we're going to see, I believe we're going to see this centurion in heaven with us one day. In fact, I believe he's already there. Would you notice a third surprising result as we consider this scene, and that is the response of the women in verses 40 and 41. It says, There were also some women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the Less, and Joseph, and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they used to follow him and minister to him, and there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Notice the women didn't run away. You might say, well, where were the disciples? Well, they were gone. The only one that we know of that still remained at the crucifixion was John. The rest of them had scattered. They fled. They were terrified. But the women remained there to the end, loyal and faithful to Jesus. In fact, as we think about who who was there, the women were there to the end. But isn't it interesting to also note that they were also the first ones to the tomb. And they were also, therefore, the first ones to see the resurrected Lord. Where were the men? They weren't around. But the ladies were there. In fact, notice it tells us who was there that day that Jesus was crucified. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of of James, and, and, uh, and also Joseph and Salome. In other words, Jesus' mother was there. But it tells us that there were others also. They're not named. But there was quite a group of women. And many of those women had been following him for several years during his ministry, taking care of him, ministering to him. They were there with Jesus right to the end. Well, we've seen the renting of the temple, the remark of the centurion, and the response of the women. But I want you to see a fourth surprising result. And to do so, we need to turn in our Bibles over to Matthew 27. In fact, for these last two, we're going to find them here in Matthew chapter 27. 
Because it's here that Matthew records something that happened physically at the very moment that Jesus gave up his life on the cross. Fourthly, in Matthew 27, 51, would you notice the reaction of the earth? It says, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The very moment that Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn, and at the very same time, there was an earthquake, and rocks were literally split apart. You know, whenever God spoke, Whenever God appeared to people, many times it was accompanied by the supernatural. It was accompanied by an earthquake. In fact, when God spoke to the people on Mount Sinai and he gave Moses the Ten Commandments, the Bible says the mountain was quaking. There was an earthquake. When God spoke to Elijah, there was an earthquake. When God delivered David from Saul, there was an earthquake. You see, in the Bible, earthquakes are a sign that God is at work, that God is doing something special, that God is intervening in human history and doing something very significant and very important. And we find that in the book of Revelation, once again, when some of the plagues begin to be poured out upon the earth, there will be earthquakes because God is working, and many times earthquakes can also be significant that God is, is dealing with people, with the earth, in judgment. But there is a fifth and final surprising result that we don't want to forget here. And we find it in Matthew 27, verses 52 and 53. We've seen the temple was rent, and, and we've seen the remark of the centurion, and the women were there, and, and the earth was shaking, but watch this. The Bible says the tombs were opened and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The fifth and final of those surprising results is the resurrection of the saints. People literally came out of their graves the moment that Jesus died. And the Bible says they didn't just hang around the cemeteries. They walked into town. They went into some of the villages. Can you imagine what a testimony that would have been to have had a loved one resurrected at the moment that Jesus dies and suddenly they're appearing at your doorstep? Can you just imagine people's surprise? Can you imagine a man saying to his wife, Wilma, we have a guest for dinner. You won't believe who it is. This was happening all over the place. Again, an evidence that God was doing something supernatural the day that God died. The day God died was unlike any other in human history. Now, why was his death so necessary? For this simple reason that sin separates us from God. Jesus came to pay the penalty on the cross that day for all of our sin. And the Bible tells us that if we will open our hearts to Jesus, if we will receive him, we can be born again. We've been born once physically. The Bible says to go to heaven, we have to be born again spiritually. And so when Jesus died on the cross, the door was opened, the, 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 the way was prepared, but each of us has to respond personally, individually, to that opportunity. I ask you today, as we, as we close this time together, have you opened your heart to Jesus Christ? Have you invited God to be your forgiver, to be the Lord of your life? I want to take a moment and just pray with you right now. Perhaps you're where you're sitting right now in your, in your home, in your apartment. Uh, you, may, you may be any number of places. It doesn't really matter because God is listening. God can meet you right where you are. doesn't matter where you are. doesn't matter what you've done in the past. We have an all-forgiving God. Do you realize that when Jesus hung on the cross and all the sin of the world was placed upon him, do you realize that your sin 
Even though you live 2,000 years after the event, all of the sin of all the world for all time, past, present, and future, was all laid upon Jesus. Your sin has already been forgiven, but you have to receive it as a gift. How do we do that? We receive as a gift God's forgiveness through prayer. And I'd like to just take a moment and have us bow together in prayer. And if you're not sure that you are a part of God's family, that you know him personally, I want to invite you to pray this prayer. It can be silently or out loud, wherever you are. Would you pray this prayer with me right now and invite Christ to come into your heart and to receive his gift? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I realize you died on the cross for me. Right now, I open my heart and my life. I ask you to come into my heart to forgive me of my sin, to now make me the kind of person you know I can become. Thank you for coming into my heart as you promised and for giving me eternal life. Amen. I want you to know if you prayed that prayer right now, Jesus came into your heart. You have experienced what the Bible calls being born again. But this is just the beginning. You need to begin to grow. You need to begin to discover all that Jesus has done for you. And that's why I encourage people, if, if they have said yes to Jesus in the manner in which we just described it, that you would begin to read the Gospel of Mark. It's the shortest of the Gospel accounts. But what a wonderful place to begin as you see un, unfolding before your eyes the very life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Read the Gospel of Mark. You'll have a terrific time discovering all that Jesus has done. But again, I want to thank you for being with us today. We look forward to next Sunday because we all know what next Sunday is, don't we? It's Easter Sunday. And we look forward to returning again and worshiping the Lord together, rejoicing in Easter Sunday, in His resurrection, and all He has done for us. Until that time, God bless. We look forward to seeing you again next week.